Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Landon Masters, the Community Outreach and Communications Manager for the South Carolina Office of Regulatory Staff. I want to welcome you to today's uh, webinar titled How the Regulation of Motor Carriers Affects Local Governments. Um, we have a couple of our Transportation Department staff members um, that are going to be talking about um, how we regulate motor carriers, um, what types of motor carriers that we regulate, and then some of those um, things that may affect folks at the local government level. Um, but before we get into that presentation and discussion about that, I wanted to talk about a couple of um, housekeeping items. Um, we have everyone that is on mute right now, so um, please keep yourself on mute. Um, when you're not speaking, that way we can reduce background noise. And then um, I do ask that if you have any questions um, to put those in the chat box um, while the presentation is going and we will get to those questions either during the presentation if it is relevant to, to what we're talking about right then before we move on to the next topic or um, we will get to all questions at the end. Um, so feel free to put those in the chat box um, whenever you have questions and we'll get those answered for you. So before I talk a little bit about the ORS, I wanted to say that this webinar um, was uh, kind of the, uh, came out of a conversation that we had with the Municipal Association of South Carolina. And they've been a great partner in helping to um, get the word out about this um, webinar and the resources that we have here at the ORS. Um, and they talked about how it would be great to um, provide what is the process before it gets to the local level or how what we do at the state might affect um, the, our folks at the local government level. So wanted to send a special shout out to our partners over at the Municipal Association of South Carolina and thank them for um, their support in this afternoon's webinar. So the Office of Regulatory Staff was created um, with the enactment of Act 175 um, in 2004. And um, many of you may know uh, the Office of Regulatory Staff or the ORS um, as the regulatory um, authority over our public utilities or our major utility industries, um, such as you know, electric, natural gas companies, um, telecommunications, water, wastewater, um, and transportation which we are going to talk about today. Um, so we do a lot of different things here at the ORS and cover a lot of different areas. Um, and so if you wanna learn more about what we do as a state agency, you can visit our website at ors.sc.gov. Um, but today we are going to focus on our regulation of transportation motor carriers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Tom Allen who is going to talk a little bit about um, the purpose for today's webinar, give a little bit more uh, background, and then also go into our transportation network company. So Tom, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Landon. Uh, thank you once again for everyone being here. Uh, just to reiterate what Landon said, my name is Tom Allen. I'm the Director of Safety, Transportation, and Telecommunications here at the Office of Regulatory Staff. Um, just to give you a little bit of background of, of, of while we're uh, conducting our forum today, our internal slogan uh, is educate while we regulate. So each year we, we attempt, and we've been fairly successful over the last four or five years, uh, to have a, a, a public forum, if you will, in which we attempt to educate various sectors of the economy on what we do at ORS. Uh, I believe three or four years ago, we did a, a uh, passenger uh, transportation form that was open to the public and to our passenger carriers. Uh, two years ago, we actually did a, a TNC, Transportation Network uh, Company, uh, forum that was open to our drivers in South Carolina as well as to the public. And then last year, we did a forum uh, for household good movers in which we uh, attempted to better educate them on how they could operate within the rules and the regulations. Um, so we went a little bit outside our comfort zone this year. And as, as Landon uh, mentioned, um, we were contacted by the Municipal Association and we thought because uh, transportation does 
uh, impact uh, local governments heavily uh, that we would take some time to be able to um, host a forum for uh, our local uh, and county partners. So we do want to take some time to build relationships. That's why we're here. And at the end of the day, our goal at ORS is to promote safety and, and public safety. So again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we certainly do appreciate it. And please feel free to ask questions, uh, not only during the forum of myself and Jenna and Thomas, uh, but also feel free to contact us uh, anytime after the forum. Uh, so let's move on. My piece of the presentation will deal with transportation network carriers. You'll advance a slide, Landon. All right, our TNCs, okay? They are more commonly known uh, by the trade names Uber and Lyft, but we do also have some other TNCs, uh, smaller mom and pop type TNCs throughout the state that we regulate. And by definition, a TNC uh, is a company that attempts to match a passenger with a driver for compensation on a digital platform. In order to be eligible to operate as a TNC in South Carolina, you do have to receive certification uh, through our office and hold a permit uh, issued by our office. So if you'll advance, Landon, one more slide. Now, a little bit of background. Uh, TNCs are, are fairly new um, uh, invention, uh, mode of transportation. It started earlier this decade uh, out west, primarily in San Francisco and spread throughout the country uh, with, with Uber and Lyft. Now, initially in South Carolina, when Uber and Lyft came into our cities and our counties uh, throughout the state, they were unregulated. And our agency saw that this was transportation for compensation. So we actually filed a rule to show cause uh, in front of the Public Service Commission uh, for them to prove why they should not be a regulated entity. Um, Uber, who was leading the charge at the time, decided uh, that they did not want to have to prove in front of the Public Service Commission that they were uh, not a regulated entity. So they went to the state legislature and worked with the General Assembly to have a transportation network company law put into place. Now, early in those days, when they moved into your cities and to the counties, it probably looked a little like this, the relationship between the taxis and the TNC drivers. So what I wanted to do is just take you through the TNC statute and talk to you a little bit about how it might apply locally. I mentioned this earlier, the definition of a TNC uh, is found in our title 58, uh, uh, 58 chapter 23 in article 16. And the first thing that we see is our definition, and it defines what a TNC is. Uh, that it, again, is a company that operates on a digital network to connect passengers and drivers uh, for providing transportation for compensation. You want to move on to the next slide, Landon? The statute defines the application process. A TNC is to submit an application to provide service before the ORS. And within that application, the TNC has to demonstrate appropriate insurance requirements. They have to provide us with a trade dress, which is their little emblem or logo that must go on, on the car. They also have to provide us with their rates, as well as some other regulatory um, things that we require from them. This piece of the statute also talks about insurance coverage exclusions. It talks about how the insurance companies can actually exclude covering uh, TNCs for certain things. And then it goes into the insurance coverage requirements. Um, and it states that a driver has to notify his insurance company that he is operating as a TNC driver. It also gives the limits um, that a driver must have when he's on his app, but doesn't have a passenger in the car. And then it mandates that a driver, excuse me, that the TNC provide $1 million in coverage while providing a pre-arranged pre ride with a passenger uh, in the vehicle. In advance, Landon. The TNC uh, statute also mandates that vehicles are inspected by a licensed mechanic in South Carolina once per year. Now there's an issue with this part of the statute. There's no such thing as a licensed mechanic in South Carolina. A mechanic is a mechanic is a mechanic. Um, so we've had to make some, have some regulatory flexibility, but we do make sure that each vehicle is, um, is inspected by a reputable mechanic. 
Uh, and these inspections have to be conducted each year. And also they have to display an approved trade dress, that's their emblem or logo, and a lot, their license tag number on the front of a vehicle. That license tag number uh, requirement was just put into place about a year and a half ago. There was a tragedy in Five Points here in Columbia in which a college student uh, was kidnapped and murdered and uh, the resulting legislation requires that TNCs put their, um, their license tag number on the front of their vehicle. It can be on their windshield, it can be on the front plate, as long as it's on the front. This piece of the statute also gives the ORS uh, the ability to inspect drivers uh, and their vehicles. And it also says that any of their records have to be made available, the TNC and the TNC's drivers, the records must be available upon request. You can advance, Landon. Now, each TNC must maintain a driver file for each of the drivers that they have in South Carolina. Um, just as a kind of a ballpark estimate, right now, uh, Uber has about 10,000 drivers in South Carolina. Uh, Lyft has about half that number, and then obviously we have those smaller moms and pops. But each of those drivers um, uh, are required to have a driver file that the TNC maintains. Well, what's going to be in that driver file? Number one, they have to have that driver file open before they operate, but they also have to have a valid driver's license and proof that they're 21 years of age. They have to have a 10-year driving record, a criminal background check, and a search of the National Sex Offender Registry. They have to have their proof of insurance, and obviously they can't drive if they've been convicted of a DUI, if they're a sex offender, or obviously if they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Our agency conducts a driver file audit each year on each of the TNCs in which we validate that the requirements of the driver file are indeed found in, in uh, with the TNC and that they're maintaining their driver files as they're supposed to. Next slide, Landon. Fifty eight twenty three sixteen sixty talks about the standards uh, that TNCs are required to operate under. Number one, they have to a uh, driver and a passenger have to be matched on the digital network. They also there cannot be any on demand or street hails and they cannot accept cash payments, including tips. The idea behind this is uh, a safety. Um, if a passenger gets in a vehicle and pays cash for a ride, well, there's never any record of that trip. And obviously the passenger, uh, uh, you know, could suffer, you know, robbery, uh, assault, whatever the case may be, but it also, affect, it also um, protects the drivers. The same thing could be said of a, a passenger. You can imagine, we see it in taxis fairly frequently in which, you know, a ne'er-do-well gets in a, 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 the back of a taxi and ends up robbing a driver that has a large stash of cash. All right, next slide, Landon, please. Okay, continuing with our standards, a driver has to display an ID badge, including his photograph, his first name, vehicle, make and model, and vehicle license plate number. These can be displayed in his app on his phone. So it doesn't necessarily have to be just like the taxis have, you know, a posted placard within the vehicle it can actually be on the app. And if a passenger or one of our inspectors asks to see their identification and their other information, then it's available on the app. And also they have to carry their proof of insurance, just like all of us when we get in our vehicle must have proof of insurance. Next slide, Landon. Okay, continuing with our standards. Um, probably the most important thing, and, and one thing that the transportation uh, industry is infamous for is, is uh, you know, elongating their routes, right? Taking a long route so they can charge a bigger fare. Within our TNC statute, it mandates that a TNC driver must take the most direct, direct route from the origination to the termination. Landon, let's try this second video. I think I may have fixed it. Let's see if we can get it going. Where are you headed? The airport. Great. Just a couple of errands and we'll get you there.
That was one bitch of a clash. Anyways, what time's your flight? It's in 20 minutes. Oh, boy, I can't make it in 20 minutes. I better call you a lift. Come on, hurry up, get in. I hope you like the offspring. Let's go! Wait. All right, did we hear it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I heard it at least. And, and apologize <laughs> for that, that risque language in there, but but I thought that uh, that was humorous enough for, for everybody to take a look at it and it was appropriate to, to our discussion right now. Uh, of course, in, in the uh, standards piece, uh, you know, drivers can't discriminate based on destination, um, their race, color, national origin, religious belief, affiliation, sex, disability, or age. And of course, they have to be able to provide access with persons with disabilities, including service animals uh, and mobility devices. All right, next slide, Landon. Next piece of our statute really deals with records, and that's primarily for complaint resolution. It, it uh, you know, it makes the TNCs keep records that are available for our inspection. Uh, the, really, the two types of complaints that are addressed in the TNC statute are carrier on carrier complaint, um, meaning TNC on TNC, and also passenger on driver complaint. So if a passenger thinks they've been overcharged or haven't been treated fairly, then we deal with those complaints. This is what is not regulated by the statute, is driver on carrier complaint. And overwhelmingly, that's our biggest source of complaints is that drivers come to us and think that they've been stiffed by Uber and Lyft uh, on their rate. And unfortunately, we just can't do anything for them. Now, the piece I think that is most relevant to you is this enforcement piece. This statute, anything in the TNC statute can be enforced by any law enforcement officer. Our agency is not the only agency tasked with enforcement. Uh, especially the field enforcement. It is tasked to every law enforcement agency in South Carolina. So any violation of the TNC Act, it's a civil penalty. And the first violation is $100. Second violation of the TNC Act is $500. $100 for a third violation. And any of these must be heard uh, before a, ma a magistrate. Okay, advanced planning. Now, some administrative pieces of it. Each TNC is required uh, to pay a gross receipts tax to our agency. Uh, once per year, the TNCs are required to submit a form that has their total, their gross revenue in South Carolina. And a tiny fraction of that revenue has to be remitted uh, to our agency. What is that for? It's for field enforcement and it's for administration of the local assessment fee and, and uh, record keeping, our inspection process, our audit process, et cetera. Next slide, Landon. Second thing that I think is very important to our, our county and our uh, uh, municipal partners is the local assessment fee. Many of you on this uh, forum today may be familiar with this. Going in a little bit of background, when that TNC statute was being drafted five or six years ago, Many of the municipalities and many of the counties wanted to be able to uh, require each of the drivers uh, that were performing services in their area, require them to have a business license. And the municipal association, my understanding, and Uber and Lyft kind of came to an agreement in which they presented to the legislature, which was the local assessment fee. And the local assessment fee is based on a gross trip fare based on its origination point. In other words, if you were to take an Uber or a Lyft trip and you begin in, in Lexington County and you travel here to Columbia in Richland County, then the gross trip fare, that piece of the local assessment fee would actually go to Lexington County. Um, the local assessment fee is based on the GIS information that's made available from revenue and physical, affair, physical affairs, and it's 1% of the local assessment fee. So in other words, if I take an Uber or Lyft trip for $100, 1% of that $100 trip is remitted to our agency, which eventually will make its way down to the counties and the municipalities. ORS keeps 1%. Of that 1% for uh, administering the local assessment fee, 
and then the proportional balance of that fee is distributed to the various counties and municipalities, again, based on that origination date. The report of the local assessment fee is due to ORS from the TNCs within 30 days of the end of the quarter. So in three days now, um, that local assessment fee report from our TNCs is due to me. And then within 30 days of that or 60 days of the end of the quarter, we cut checks and send them out to the municipalities and to the counties based on their proportion of the um, fees that they are to receive. The local assessment fee, the statute does not um, require that the counties or municipalities spend that money in any certain way. It can go to their general fund, it can go to transportation improvement pro uh, projects, it can go to field enforcement, it can go to whatever it wants to. The other piece of this local assessment fee uh, provision of the statute is the municipal association can actually request an audit and in fact did so about two years ago of uh, the amounts that Uber and Lyft and any TNC was submitting uh, to our office. Okay, advance, Lannon. And then just wrapping up our statute, again, important to our, our county and, and municipal partners, TNCs are subject to all local ordinances, traffic laws, airport procedures, pick up and drop off, et cetera. In other words, if it's not specifically addressed in the TNC statute, the TNC driver must follow the law of the jurisdiction in which they're in. We oftentimes hear stories of a police officer pulling over a TNC driver and them arguing with the officer saying, you can't touch me, I'm operating under the TNC law because they you know, turn right on red or whatever the case may be. And that's just not true. They have to, every TNC driver has to obey the local ordinances. And then 5823.20 really deals with uh, the provisioning of service at the airport. All right, Landon, next slide. Okay, some of the common issues that we see. The TNC statute is the minimum requirements. T TNCs can make more stringent requirements. In its most simplistic example, what that means is even though the TNC law says that a driver might have to be 21 years old uh, to perform service, the TNC can say, nope, I want all my drivers to be in at least 25. In fact, we have one of our smaller mom and pop TNCs that actually does that. Whenever we're doing our field enforcement, we always uh, uh, emphasize to our drivers that they need to monitor their driver page on the TNC website because oftentimes we will go to the TNC and say we're seeing problems at A, B, and C and the TNCs will help uh, resolve that problem and put the mechanism for resolving that problem on their website for us. Again, reiterating drivers must obey those local ordinances. Also important to know a TNC driver cannot advertise independently. A TNC driver cannot open a Facebook page that says, hey, I'm a TNC driver, call me and I'll take you to the airport for 20 bucks. That is in violation of the TNC statute. They can't hand out business cards. That's a violation of the TNC statute. And the reason it is, is because they're using Uber and Lyfts and another TNC's name uh, to enrich themselves without sharing uh, the profits with the TNC. And then, of course, they have to always display their approved trade dress when they're on duty, not just when they have a passenger, when they are on that app. And I left this out, but obviously they have to have that um, license tag number that I mentioned earlier on the front of the vehicle. All right, next slide, Landon. The app also must match the vehicle, the tag, and the driver. What that means is I can't use my brother-in-law's app in my car and it shows his vehicle, his tag and his driver and I'm performing services under his name. So I have to, if I'm in a 2017 Toyota Camry with VIN number XYZ, license plate number XYZ123, then that's what my app has to show. And it's also important to note that a TNC driver cannot use that TNC vehicle to conduct other regulated transportation services. In other words, they can't be a taxi cab, they can't be a charter vehicle, they can't be a non-emergency vehicle. And the most important thing that we emphasize to our drivers when we're doing our field enforcement, be kind and considerate. 
to your passengers. The most important thing that the TNCs look at, the TNC corporations look at, is the driver ratings. They have to maintain a certain driver rating and able to continue to perform services for that TNC. So with that and said, I've talked enough. It's a good time for another video. Landon, if you could hit us up. This is if moms were Uber drivers. Are you Jeff? I am, thank you for coming. Uh... Oh, that's okay, just climb in the middle. Oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> Who wants a juice box? Jay, me. Jeff, juice? Okay, everybody buckle up. Jeff, I need you to buckle up. I think there's something on the seat belt. Oh, it's just yogurt. Buckle up. Okay. We've had a long day. You have a lot of nose hair. Oh, that's not nice, kids. They're so adorable. Can I have those back, please? I'm also really thirsty and I'm super duper hot. Mom, when are we gonna be there? Don't do that, don't do that. Keep your hands to yourself. I have to pee! Mom, I can't wait, I really have to pee. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. Mom! Hey, uh, don't throw things Mom! You're gonna make me have an accident. I don't care, I did! I got way too long and this dude is annoying me! This dude is paying for your ballet lessons! Which dude? Uh, you can just let me off right up here. Oh no, we're not there yet. Uh, please, it's fine. You can let me off. I'm right not here. letting you off in the wrong place. It's fine. Please let me off right no, up here. No, I'm not ah. letting you out. I please let me off right. I here. won't get my fare if I let you off here. I will pay your full fare. I'll pay you to let me off. No, please. that's not how it works. Uh, please let me off right up here. Okay, that's one. But two. Please. Don't make me go to three. You know you're gonna get a big fat timeout. <sighs> okay, we're here. Okay. Hi, Jeff. Hope you had a nice ride. Hey, <laughs> You only give me one star? Sure. That, thank you, Landon. I, I bring that to your attention because part of our enforcement is to emphasize to these drivers, not just the TNC driver, but the taxi drivers, the charter drivers, the non-emergency, that everything that goes on in your vehicle is your responsibility. Not only is it your responsibility, but also it impacts your return business. So you want to make it as good of an experience uh, for your customer as possible. Landon, if you'll advance to the, my final slide, please. Okay, now I've spent a lot of time talking about, uh, you know, being able to find the drivers, writing tickets and this, that, and the other, but it's actually not our most in, uh, important enforcement technique. Our most in important enforcement technique is our relationships with the TNCs. Um, typically, when we find out a driver is doing something that's against the TNC statute, we actually quite infrequently write a citation. Typically, what we do is go to the TNC, Uber, and Lyft, and we simply ask them to deactivate the driver so that they can't perform services anymore. You saw that the fine's $100 for not having your trade dress. You know, it's easy just for them to write a check to a magistrate for $100, but if we take away their ability to, um, to provide service and earn five and six and ten times that, they we have found... Uh, that is much more effective in terms of enforcement and getting compliance because at the end of the day, the most important thing is to ensure that each of these drivers and the companies are complying with the law.
So with that in mind, I'll be available for questions later on. Landon, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks everybody for your time. Awesome, thank you, Tom. Um, just wanted to give a gentle reminder um, for folks, if you have questions, um, feel free to put those in the chat box um, while we are giving the presentation. And then at the end, we will go through questions um, and allow folks to unmute themselves um, if they'd like to, to ask a question for our folks that are just called in through the phone. Um, so I'm going to next turn it over um, here to talk about uh, passenger carriers. I'm going to turn it over here to Thomas. I think this one's actually Jenna. This Actually one's Jenna. Sorry, Jenna. <laughs> no problem. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> no problem. Go ahead, Jenna. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Landon. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Landon said, my name is uh, Jenna Sorrell. Um, I also work within Tom's Department of Safety, Transportation, and Telecommunications at the Office of Regulatory Staff, and I'm the Transportation and Operations Manager. Uh, I've been at ORS uh, right at four years, I uh, actually this month, I think, and predominantly work within the realm of uh, transportation motor carriers, as we're discussing today, and more specifically passenger carriers. So I'll be covering that portion for us today. Um, so we do have, ORS has regulatory oversight in addition to the transportation network companies. We also have oversight over the licensing and certification of class C carriers. So those class C carriers are listed here below. That's gonna be taxi charter, which is also known as limousine, charter bus, non-emergency and stretcher van, which usually go in tandem. And then we have those transportation network companies that Tom covered. So just to give a little bit of a um, distinction between each of those types of class C, taxis are gonna be um, anywhere from seven, um, from one to 15 passengers for the vehicles. Those charged by mile um, and they're those not pre-scheduled trips or arranged rides. So those usually go through some type of that booking or dispatch service, which I'm sure you know all of you are aware of. And then charter is going to also fall within that one to 15 passenger range. Those are gonna vary a little bit. They charge by the trip or per hour. And those do have to be those pre-scheduled or arranged rides. Charter bus is very similar to charter as well. Um, the main difference here is the passenger amount of the vehicle. So charter vehicles only go up to that 15 passenger mark. Charter bus vehicles are gonna be um, 16 or more passengers. And then they also follow that same schedule of how to schedule their trips um, by trip or per hour, and they need to be pre-scheduled or pre-arranged. Non-emergency transportation companies are gonna be those that um, they charge by a combination of different things, trip, mile, round trip maybe. Um, specifically, this non-emergency transportation um, is obviously specific to just, just the way the naming convention goes. So it could be anything from taking someone to a, a doctor's appointment or taking them to a dialysis appointment or, or anything in between. Um, this one's a little bit interesting. It is the only way that um, if a company wants to, a transportation motor carrier wants to use Medicaid in their billing system, uh, they have to go through this non-emergency type of transportation and they have to work with a Medicaid broker within the state. Um, our biggest one right now, and I think currently the only one is known as Logisticare and that name probably rings you know, a few bells for some of you. Um, and just to cover the passenger restrictions for these as well, also that one to 15 passenger range and that stretcher van is just as it sounds, that's gonna only carry you know, that one passenger and then that driver. So let's move on to the next slide, please, Landon. Okay, so to cover a little bit of the application and certification process, um, if someone comes and says they wanna start a transportation business and they wanna transport passengers for compensation or for hire, they must become a certified transportation motor carrier in the state of South Carolina. To become certified, these businesses are required to obtain what is called a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. We abbreviate that CPCN, if you see it throughout the slideshow. So to apply for a certificate, an applicant first starts with the South Carolina Public Service Commission and not actually with ORS. 
So applications for each, each type of certificate are all online and electronic, thank goodness, and they're listed on the Public Service Commission's website, and I provided a link there um, in the presentation. Each application, um, whether it's taxi, charter, what have you, will provide step-by-step -step instructions that assist the applicant with the certification process. Um, we do estimate that the timeline for the certification takes about four to six weeks. And the timeline, this, I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of how that walks through from the Public Service Commission and then to our agency. So initially the Public Service Commission um, is the one that's gonna receive the application from a carrier. So they need to submit that to them. And then um, the Public Service Commission will assign it a docket number after reviewing the application. And then they will place it on their agenda for review. They then hold a commission meeting in which they vote to grant an order which will approve the application for that transportation carrier. Once they've approved it and issued the order, the applicant then has 90 days from the date that the order is issued in order to comply with the rules and regulations they need to comply with for the Public Service Commission. So once that happens, it then comes over to the Office of Regulatory Staff. At that point, to comply with the Public Service Commission's order, the applicant must satisfy um, various compliance requirements by ORS. We provide these requirements to each applicant because they do vary a little bit depending on the type of certificate that they are applying for. Um, it could, uh, you know, a few of the main ones are for all of the Class C taxi charter non-emergency, they have to register and pay for license decal stickers, which I'll cover here more thoroughly in a moment, um, have to have a vehicle inspection done and a driver file audit completed by, OR, by an ORS inspector, and then we require proof of insurance, and I'll delve more into each of those a little bit more. Um, upon completion of these requirements, ORS then, of course, issues the applicant a certificate of public convenience and necessity, which allows them to start operating. So, thank you, Landon. Okay, so on to the next. Um, our regulatory enforcement for passenger carriers, as it is for most, for most everything we, in, we regulate, is kind of a combination of a team effort within our department, which includes both an approach from an office and kind of administrative work approach and also field enforcement. So I'm gonna cover a few of the more um, in-house items that we do first. Um, one of those is the license decals. These are required by South Carolina law, um, all class C transportation motor carriers, passenger carriers must pay semi-annually for license decals. These must be paid in order for them to register a vehicle that they can use to transport passengers. So we do these twice a year. There's two enforcement periods, as you can see there. Um, and as mentioned, they're only required for taxi, charter, non-emergency and stretcher vans. So this does exclude charter bus. This excludes the transportation network companies that Tom was talking about, as well as household good, which Thomas McGill will cover in a moment. Um, also, just a small tidbit, if, there, if a Class C company has 20 or more vehicles registered for them, they are not required to pay and have um, license decals on their vehicles. So we do keep a record of, a, I think we have maybe around 30 companies that meet that requirement and don't have to pay for those license decals. We do keep a record of that. If you ever need to confirm or check on any of that, we're more than happy uh, to help. And of course, these license decals, which I'm sure most of you have seen them or, or are aware of them, there's a picture over there on the slideshow of what they do generally look like. Um, the colors do change twice a year so that we can keep a better track, especially for field enforcement, to know which license decals are in effect at that time. And they must be displayed at all times on the registered vehicle's windshield. Next slide, Landon. The next in-house item that we regulate is insurance. So insurance is also, of course, required by law for any passenger carrier um, transportation companies. We require what's called a Form E, which is a state insurance filing. Its um, fancy name is known as the Uniform Motor Carrier Bodily Injury and Property Liability Certificate. Um, it's essentially just 
automobile liability, it's commercial automobile liability. And that's the proof of insurance that we require for class C's and that's it. Um, the ORS, we maintain these insurance filings for compliance. And of course, if you're not in compliance and you don't have this current insurance on file with us in the form of a form E, then what we do eventually is we move forward with suspending a company certificate, which, allow, which disallows them from operating. They can no longer operate until we get a new Form E proof of insurance. So we do maintain that very, very strictly. Next slide, Landon. And just to cover a little more on the insurance, um, the insurance liability limits do vary. Um, they depend primarily on the type of certificate, also the passenger capacity of the vehicle that's being used for that type of transportation. So I made this um, table. I know these slides will be available as will the presentation, but so I, I won't read it off to you, but that's a kind of a breakdown of how that works and how the insurance minimum limits are over on the right hand side. Pretty straightforward. As you can see, the biggest one that we get questions about is going to be that bottom, which is the non emergency stretcher van requirements. That does have the highest minimum um, by far. It does require a million dollar liability coverage in addition to a thousand dollar medical payments per person. So we, we do get quite a few questions about that. That is the way the law is written and um, that's gonna be the highest one of the group. Next, Landon. Thank you. So um, to move on to our field enforcement, uh, just to reiterate, like I said, we kind of do a combination of a regulatory enforcement effort. So we do have three transportation inspectors in the field. Um, they reg provide regulatory enforcement out there, you know, boots on the ground for us in addition to the stuff that we do in house. So they are broken up by three sections of the state. Um, we have John Teeter, George Parker, and James McAllister. Those are our three current transportation inspectors. Um, and I provided kind of a list of their enforcement area for you in that map located on the slideshow. So some of the things that they do in the field to provide, to provide regulatory enforcement, um, they do investigations, they um, handle complaints. I know as Tom was speaking earlier, they handle any complaints, whether it's um, someone calling in um, driver on driver, they kind of help to alleviate those. If it's someone, a customer calling in thinking that they, you know, we're overcharged or whatnot, we refer those to our office as well. And then they also look at vehicles as part of that initial inspection requirement to get um, a certification. They have to inspect those vehicles and they have to go out there and look for things such as um, the name of the company needs to be on the vehicle, it needs to be lettered correctly in a minimum of three inch lettering. They're looking for license plates. They're looking for overall safety of the vehicle, functionality, all of those good things. And of course, they're also looking for those decal stickers to be prominent on those windshields. Um, they also look at driver, they do driver file audits. That's another requirement just to get a certificate. They have to audit at least one driver file. And then of course they can do random audits on any of these items whenever they so choose out in the field. But for that, they're looking for a lot of different things. They look for um, similar things to the transportation network company, such as a sex offender, a motor vehicle background check, driver's license, multiple things that they're looking for just to ensure that safety and compliance are in order. And they're also looking at advertising as well. You can't do illegal advertising. You have to advertise as the type of company that you are. Um, you can't advertise, obviously. We have, you know, every now and then we run into people advertising as a transportation company and they don't have that certificate yet. And of course, our inspectors go up and they address that. And we try to bring those people into compliance overall. So the inspectors out there in the field, they can issue citations to any company that's in violation of any of these compliance requirements. So anything they find, whether it's a decal not on the vehicle, uh, the vehicle's not lettered correctly, or they're missing something in their driver files, they can write um, any pretty hefty citations depending on what the violation is. Next slide, please. So one of the big ways that we um, do regulate and enforce regulation, um, the kind of the last step of if a company is not in compliance is we do have the um, authority to, we file petitions 
to revoke certificates twice a year for noncompliance. Um, we file these petitions with the South Carolina Public Service Commission, and they're the ones that actually um, have the authority to revoke them. But we file the petitions of, of groups of transportation companies that are not in compliance. So we do file these petitions to revoke for either one of these following two reasons, either failure to maintain proof of insurance, that's that form E that we discussed, or failure and or, I'm sorry, failure to pay those license decal fees and have those on their windshields as well. Um, once a certificate is revoked by this process, I would like to mention that it's, it's a lengthy process. We file that petition with the Public Service Commission. The company is not revoked the next day. I mean, it has to go through a little bit of a legal proceeding. There has to be a notice to the carriers letting them know that they've been placed on that petition. And then also there's a hearing that has to take place to be able to revoke those certificates. Um, so they do have a long time to come into compliance within that time. But once a certificate is revoked, that transportation company can no longer operate as a business that transports passengers for hire. They, if they can restart their business at a later date if they choose to do so. Um, if they restart within a year, they can request to reinstate their certificate. If, they, if it's past that year mark, then they have to start that entire application and certification process over again from the beginning that we discussed earlier. And next slide, please. So um, this is just a really helpful tool that I thought I would go over with you all. And um, I guess we can go, I'll discuss it first. And then if we wanna go to the link, we can. On our website, our Office of Regulatory Staff website, we have a list of all the active transportation motor carriers that are regulated at that time. Um, we move to update that list every two months. We keep that on the website and each different certificate type has a regulated carriers list. All the way from taxi and charter to the transportation network companies Tom was discussing and to the household goods company that Thomas McGill will go over. So every regulated carriers list is on a certificates webpage. And um, Landon, do you want to click on that? Are you able to click on that link just to show them? Um, in the essence of time, I'm gonna- um, We can go move forward. Yeah. Absolutely. It's pretty self-explanatory really. I mean, once you get on there, you just click on the certificate type you'd like to see. And then you can um, click, it's usually the first link will list all of the regulated companies at that time. And of course, if you have any questions at all, just give us a call, contact us, email us. I'm happy to help with any of that. And it does display all this information. Um, for example, I took a little snippet of the taxi list that we currently have up. It gives you the name of the company, um, a contact, contact information, phone number, all that good stuff. Next slide. I'll move, and, I'm sorry, I need to move fast. <laughs> and we have a question about how can we find out which drivers are active which e with each company? Which drivers are active? Yes. We do not keep a list of drivers. Um, we do keep a list of vehicles. So we would be able to confirm whether a vehicle was active or not. I believe, um, in, I don't think we have a way to confirm whether a driver specifically, but we could confirm that vehicle. Um, I think. Okay. Sorry, I think Tom said something in the. Chat. Yeah, I think Tom was um, answering the other. Oh, question another question. So, I mean, I yeah, I we don't have a way. It's it's more we it's more down to the vehicle for us. Of course, if the driver gets you know pulled over or something by one of our inspectors. Um, they do get ticketed and that's who that's who they write the ticket to if gosh if something does happen but we don't keep a list of drivers or keep that in house or on record um, if our inspectors did a random audit of driver files then of course they could pull anyone that was driving for that company at that time so i it's, hope that answers that um, question. can i interrupt real quick go ahead tom yeah, okay. Uh, one of the other reasons that we don't keep the um, uh, records of drivers is oftentimes think in terms of taxis, in which sometimes uh, the drivers will be driving different vehicles. Um, in other words, you may be in taxi A one day, taxi B the next day, etc. 
Um, so that, that is one of the reasons that we do not maintain list of drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, so really it goes down to the vehicle just to kind of follow up on what Tom's saying. Um, so last slide for me, and I know we're um, trying to move quickly. So a few things that we don't regulate on the passenger carrier side, uh, school buses, that's DPS, ambulatory transportation, that's going to be DHEC, commodity and freight trucking, that's going to be the Department of Motor Vehicles, specifically, um, to my knowledge, the Certificate of Compliance Division, and then intracity passenger carriers, which would be, for example, in Charleston, those um, small trolley tour buses that just go around in a small loop within the city. Um, if they don't pass city limits, then we technically do not regulate that transportation. And I think that is all I have. I'll quickly thank everyone for attending and taking the time out to participate with us virtually and we'll be available for questions. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Landon and Thomas McGill. And now it's time for Thomas. Um, so <laughs> Thomas, um, in in the eff essence of time, um, we we do, you know, we're ending at three o'clock. We can go maybe a couple minutes over, but um, let me know if you um, if you want me to go quicker through the slides or anything. Yeah, I'll definitely move a little bit quicker through my information, especially so that we can allow for some extra questions at the end. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Thomas McGill. I work in the same department as Tom and Jenna do and, uh, and primarily focus with household good movers in the state. So that's an area that a lot of people don't realize are, is regulated throughout South Carolina. And we re actually regulate household good movers, um, large to small, anybody from your two men in a truck all the way down to your small mom and pops that will be operating more locally. Um, so that, that's really who we, who we regulate. So Lane, if you want to go to the next slide. This is a similar um, timeline to what Jenna was talking about as far as um, what that process looks like. Again, there is the link to where you can find that application for a household good mover. The certification timeline is a little bit longer than it was for the passenger carriers. And the reason for that is there are a couple extra requirements and a little bit of extra time that has to pass before the commission can approve these people to, uh, to be licensed movers. Um, so the process is very similar though. They have to file an application with the PSC first, they'll be assigned that docket number, um, and they'll also be required to publish in a media source that circulates throughout the scope they, they are seeking to serve. Um, so a lot of times for companies who are applying for say statewide authority, they will either publish in the state paper or the post and courier. Those are the two most common that we see, but let's say that they were gonna operate much more locally and let's just say in uh, Richland, Lexington and Aiken. Uh, if the Columbia Star or the Aiken Standard were to circulate through all three of those counties, then they'd be able to, to publish in a media source that way um, just because of the scope they wanna serve. As part of our process and that application with, as you'll see lower down in ORS, I actually, or someone from our office, will go set up a site visit with that mover. That's an opportunity that we like to take advantage of to meet with each mover face-to-face, -face, talk through their application, talk through their tariff and their bill of lading. Um, as some of you might know, in South Carolina, we're a set rate tariff state, so each moving company has to have a, a tariff or a set of rules of how they're going to charge each customer. Most of the time, we see that on an hourly, um, an hourly basis of say $110 an hour, but there are some companies who do that by mileage or by weight, different things like that. So that's what they have to stick to whenever they're doing all of these residential moves in South Carolina. Um, we also have to have that same insurance that Jenna was talking about, the Form E, which is that liability, but we also require a Form H, which is cargo insurance. The rates on that are a little bit lower than what we've seen on the passenger carrier, especially for that liability. The minimum in South Carolina for the cargo is $2,500. The minimum for liability is $750,000. So uh, we keep that paperwork on file and they have to keep that uh, the most up to date as they can to avoid being revoked uh, as was mentioned before. At the very end of the process, um, ORS is actually the agency that issues the certificate following the, the Public Service Commission's order that they will issue at the end of the process. Uh, Landon, next slide. Once the companies are licensed and certified in South Carolina, um, there are a couple of requirements they are required to, uh, to maintain um, in, in addition to the insurance information. We have annual reports and gross receipts that each company has to file. 
Um, basically, what that is is a way for us to track the operating revenues that these companies are generating through the, through the calendar year. Um, if they fail to, to produce those documents, then we actually can revoke those certificates. Um, if they have failed to file either or um, the annual report or the gross receipt. Uh, Landon, next slide. We do, um, and this is the part that y'all might be the most interested in of regulated versus unregulated moves. So when a move is an intra-city move, and what I mean by that is, let's say that the origination and the destination of the move is inside the same municipal limit. Let's say that it's uh, the city, downtown Charleston, let's just say. If the, if the move starts and finishes inside of that city, that's the one time that a, for a residential move there, a company is not bound by their tariff. So again, if their rates are set in their tariff at $110 an hour, um, but this move that starts and finishes inside the city limits of Charleston, they could technically charge $300 an hour if, if they so chose. On the, on the flip side, they could charge $50 an hour. Um, and that's just because we don't regulate the rates of those moves that stay inside city limits. Now, uh, we do have a lot of questions sometimes of uh, business licenses, and I know that y'all are all very familiar with that. Um, the, the business license, if, if your city requires that, they are still required to have that business license issued by your city or municipality in addition to their certificate from the state. Uh, we've had several companies who will call up here and say, how just written a ticket um, by city X because they said I didn't have the right licensing to do so. That's something we try to iterate to each one of those companies of if they need to check in the municipalities they look to be operating in, and, uh, and get those proper business licenses if they need to do so. Um, commercial moves and labor only moves, we also do not regulate in South Carolina. So if, if a company is, all they're doing is packing up the goods and loading them up on the U-Haul and the customer is driving them from point A to point B, then uh, they do not have to have a certificate to do those jobs. One way to identify those trucks that are, uh, that are licensed on the roads is they should have the same lettering as the passenger carriers are required to with the name of the company, contact information, and their certificate number, which will be a four-digit number on the, side of that, um, on the side of that vehicle. Next slide, Landon. And this goes into a little bit more detail of the intra-city moves. What we do um, is if we get a complaint that comes to our office of, I don't know, or they want to complain about the, uh, the rates that they were charged or things like that, what we do is we literally plug in point A and point B into Google Earth, and we have a city layers limit that outlines the, um, the actual city limit of, of each municipality in the state. And if it, crosses that, uh, if it crosses that line, the city limit line, then we do regulate the rates. If it's 100% within that municipal limit, then we do not uh, regulate the rates on that move. Next slide, Landon. And this is just the, uh, the statute that uh, details out what that exempt zone is, and and, uh, and, and I'm not going to read that over to you, but uh, that, that's just where that certificate of fit, willing, and able, which is still required to operate as a in, inside of municipal limits. So I think that's important to touch on. Most of these companies are applying for a certificate of public convenience and necessity, the uh, CPCN. However, if a company says, I'm only going to operate within the city limits of Greenville, they still have to have a certificate. Now, we will not regulate the rates, like I mentioned earlier. However, um, they, they still have to have a certificate to do so, and they will apply for a certificate of fit, willing, and able, an FWA. So that's where that comes from, um, and we can answer more questions on that as you go. The next slide, Landon, is talking specifically about the scope. Um, each company is, they apply to operate within a certain scope, uh, either statewide or up to three counties um, before having to go to statewide. So again, if someone were to apply, and those have to be contiguous. So you can't say Greenville, Charleston, and, and Buford. Um, let's say that you said, again, in my early example, Richland, Lexington, and Aiken, then the company can apply to have authority in those three counties, but they cannot go outside of those counties. They have to start and finish every move inside of there. So if they have that authority and someone wants them to move to Ori County, they'd have to turn that move down because they don't have the proper licensing to do that. Next slide, Landon, is some more detail on the commercial and labor of how we don't 
regulate um, that commercial stuff and the, and the labor jobs only. Next slide, Landon, and I'm wrapping up quick. This is my last slide. It's on complaints. We get a lot of complaints, um, and they, most of them come from customers themselves. However, we do have a lot of times where companies will call and say, uh, does, does, does company A have a certificate? I saw a truck riding around on the road, and, and I, don't, I don't recognize that name. That's where we would oftentimes refer them to uh, that link that we had earlier in the slideshow with the, uh, with the um, list of, of certified companies. Um, but then when it comes to this slide more specifically, most of our complaints are overcharges, damages, and then customer relations. Whenever we get complaints, what we do is we get the bill of lading, which is that uh, receipt, if you will, um, and we, we look through those, those charges, make sure it matches up to what the company's approved tariff is, and we get that same documentation from the company. The reason we do that is to make sure they both match up just so that neither party has uh, messed with or changed the numbers on that bill of lading. And if those charges line up with what the tariff states, then the company has done it correctly. Uh, estimates are not regulated in South Carolina, and there are times when companies will give a, a bad estimate. Um, but unfortunately, those customer relations are much more difficult to regulate in South Carolina and really can't be. We try to encourage companies to be as accurate um, with their estimates as they can be, um, but ultimately, there, there's no way to regulate that. The damages and in insurance, um, damages we, can, we do not have any jurisdiction over as well. Oftentimes, when we get complaints that are specifically saying that uh, my set of Chester drawers that's 50 years old got scratched up and and they're only giving me X number for the settlement. Um, we, it, they have to sign off on a particular type of insurance evaluation. The minimum in South Carolina is 60 cents per pound, um, but uh, some companies offer full value or partial value, different things like that. So as long as they have signed off on a certain, uh, on a bare minimum of 60 cents per pound, that all damage claims we refer immediately down to their uh, their small claims court. So that will be handled locally in your, uh, in your areas um, because we just don't have the jurisdiction over the damages of those types of moves. Um, the complaint mitigation, these are some things that we oftentimes refer different or try to tell different companies as they are working with customers just to try to alleviate some of those issues they might see, especially if they're repetitive. So um, I know that these, these slides are gonna be shared. If you wanna pass these along to anyone, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. And that's all that I had. We can open up for questions, Landon. Awesome. Yes, and I know that we've um, got Tom and Jenna that are in the question or in the chat box that have been answering some questions for folks. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to put those in the chat, chat box right now. Um, and I wanted to say that we are recording um, the webinar today, so we will be posting and sharing a link to that, as well as we'll follow up with the slides from the webinar um, as well, so you can refer to those. Um, so if you have any questions, put those in the chat. Uh, we've got a question about Uber Eats, DoorDash, Instacart um, for business licenses. Hey, this is Tom. I'm going to come off mute for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That's an interesting question um, in which I think the jury is still out. I know that we, that they are not under the TNC Act um, because they do not transport passengers. Um, I think one could make the case that because DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera, are not regulated by the TNC Act, and the TNC Act specifically says, thou shalt not uh, require a TNC to have a business license because they do not fall under that umbrella. I guess you could make the case that they are required to have a business license. I think I'd certainly consult, uh, you know, your city or county attorney and uh, if you wanna, if they wanna have a conversation with us about that, we'd be happy to. Awesome, thank you, Tom. I mean, I haven't seen any other questions come through the chat box, but if you are on the phone, you can feel free to unmute yourself. 
um, using star six to unmute. Um, and so we got another question from David about um, can you cover the new law regarding hospitality hospitality tax for the food delivery companies? Uh, and that's from David. Um, David, unfortunately, I cannot. Um, I, I am. Uh, that is beyond our our regulatory scope. I'm sorry to say. Well, with that, I know we have went over a little bit um, on the webinar for today, but um, as I said, we are recording and we will send out the um, recording as well as the slides um, to everyone that registered. So there, even those folks that were not able to join us today, um, here is the contact information for Tom, Jenna and Thomas. Um, feel free to reach out to them if you have any questions or myself. Um, you know that we did not cover in the webinar today once again i want to thank um, the municipal association of south carolina for helping um, to promote the the webinar and um, letting us know that this would be something that would be be helpful for us to cover um, and i hope everyone has a great rest of your day thank you very much for joining <laughs>